Hello. All right. So good morning, everybody. Let's get started. I think we're just uh, a few minutes late already. So um, this session is about accelerating development workflows primarily on OpenStack environments or private cloud. Um, this is where developers really start to write code, uh, run the build process, and then finally go to deploy. And NetApp as a company, how do we actually integrate a lot of these processes in the back end to accelerate the build process and accelerate the development process? So that's what exactly this session is about. Uh, my name is Bikash Roy Chaudhary. I'm, uh, I've been at NetApp for the last 16 years and was mostly focused on DevOps and integrations with OpenStack and, and a lot of other cross-functional activities that goes on in the organization to come up with a complete DevOps solution end-to-end, -end, including PaaS, IAS using OpenStack, and then the end, end, end goal is to have a complete solution for a development environment, right from writing code till we go and deploy um, the code and the application in production. So today's session we'll be covering, first of all, we'll start a brief introduction about who we are and then we go into the development challenges and then talk about the NetApp advantages and there are a few use cases that I have. And then after this, I will be pausing for some time to switch over to a demo. And I've been having my, um, not the good time of the demo gods, so I recorded the demo. It is not a, a live demo. Uh, but it's good enough for you to actually see what exactly we can actually provide uh, to accelerate the build process, um, and then we conclude. So NetApp as a company, we have got about $6.1 billion, uh, 3,200 plus patents that we have in our name, and then we have got about 12,000 employees today, and we've been headquarters uh, in, in Sunnyvale, California. So primarily, what are the challenges of what you normally see when you're doing an application development? So first is, how do I actually mitigate my risk? I have got a source code. Uh, I do not want to touch that until I really confirm the changes that I have made and commit those changes back to the code repository. How do I actually mitigate that risk in a lot more scalable and a lot more faster? So now if you look into all the conversations and presentations that we heard from Gartner in the keynotes and a lot of other presenters in the last couple of days, it's all about the modal IT, you know, modal IT, bimodal IT and how mode two is taking over, and the kind of perspective that we have been seeing from a lot of our customers where they talk about how, the, how is the agility, the speed, the way they can scale. And that's the reason why open source and open source tools and open stack comes into existence and it's been so powerful today that people are trying to embrace uh, the entire setup with the open, st open source very closely and very quickly in the environment. So apart from that, it comes down to the economics. How do I actually control the cost? And NetApp as a company with the integrations that we have done with OpenStack and various other components that actually completes the entire DevOps um, architecture of, this, uh, of the process, um, that itself is, is a huge enabler for us to enable this uh, open source tools, the integrations with Jenkins, and we'll talk about more of that. So that exactly reduces the overall cost if you have to see as to when you process, store, and manage data, because that's where we actually come in to make your data persistent, to protect your data. And that's where we actually come in and provide a lot of these integrations at the top layer from a developer perspective all the way down when you start to penetrate down to the infrastructure layers, including the IAS, which is OpenStack. So now if you look into this diagram, on the extreme on the other side of the top, you would see the waterfall model where you start to design, you start writing code, you build it, and there's a process which is not iterative. It is a waterfall model where the go-to-market is very slow and the dollar amount happens at the very end of, this, of the cycle, the end of the cycle. At the, um, but if you look at the left one, left-hand side, you would notice that there is an iterative process where you can keep on testing, you keep on building, you are doing a continuous integration and a continuous delivery. That means every time a build is ready, you are ready to promote it to production. So that is where the continuous integration and that is where you're having a faster time to market. That is where you see the value. And from an OpenStack perspective, the, the virtualization that we actually provide and the open source tool that actually integrate can actually leads to just to reduce the amount of time that you take, not only to deploy the code in production, but also reduce the cost of, of your overall infrastructure. 
So in this slide, I would like to say, how do I actually achieve faster time to market? So first of all, you have to give a developer focus on where, you've, uh, where the code, the continuous integration is happening and how fast the code is, can be transferred from a, from a development process to a deployment process. At the same time, continuous integration environments, how do we actually build that up? How do you create a template? How do I actually have much more uh, faster adoption on the development process? So how does a developer go and create the user, work, uh, user workspaces faster? How does it scale when I have lots of number, number of developers in my environment? And then finally, it comes down to a cultural um, development, cultural shift in the development process, where it is more of an iterative process and more testing for better code quality. That's exactly what is important because you need to be agile, and that's exactly what we're trying to figure out and how do we scale and how do we improve in the speed so that you can actually have not just a faster time to market, but also a faster time to value. So the innovations and the value that actually come out of that. Now this is another sample infrastructure that we have put together for a DevOps practice at NetApp, where we are actually having at the bottom layer all the NetApp components, and then we are stacking it up all the different, different layers of OpenStack, and we are using Liberty for that matter. Now, if you look at this, we are using Cinder, but the Manila part is not there because this is Liberty and there are some challenges in, in the maturity of Manila in this release. But with Mitaka, we'll be having that all integrated with Manila. Now, if you step by, stop by our booth in the exhibit floor, we already have a very good demo on how to use our, our NetApp technologies, which has been integrated with Manila, which we actually showcase that. If you guys haven't seen that demo, please, I would request you to stop by and take a look at the demo, and that is exactly the same technology we'll be using for, uh, as we start to form a solution around Mitaka moving forward. But as for Liberty, this is the architecture we chose to go, and if you look into the different components over here, we are building this infrastructure all for DevOps, starting from the storage component and the NetApp technology. We are using NFS as a layer to communicate with the data volumes that we are having on NetApp. And at the same time, we are also having Nova volumes, uh, Nova instances, which have been spinning up Unix and Windows platforms, and which will be a part of their build farm. You're having Jenkins, you've got Git and API services running at the same time. So literally have everything in, as far as the infrastructure is concerned, and, and then you start to build the workflow on top of that. So based on this particular template, or the architecture that you see, again, this is a, is a sample architecture, this could be done in various multiple different ways. Yes, we are putting together some set of best practices in which way you can get the best optimized performance as well as value for money. With respect to OpenStack, there will be a lot of documentation and blogs coming up and there is already a blog already published on, around that. So, but this is the architecture which will be focused in the rest of the presentation as we move forward. Now, we as a company, we've been always starting to contribute to the open source community. We have been contributing to the OpenStack community using our drivers to Cinders, drivers to Manila, Sift, so that we always stay close in, uh, close in touch with the real process and a business requirement. And these are the different plugins we have actually uh, introduced and available today. So the bottom one is actually called Code Easy that's available in GitHub. This is primarily for system and storage administrators which actually uses NetApp technology. It is a bunch of scripts which actually can be configured and tied into uh, a workflow for a developer. And just above that is the P4 Flex. This is actually for an SCM tool called Perforce. I'm not sure how many people in this room are using Perforce as an SCM tool for your development purpose. That is again another joint a development that happened between NetApp and Perforce to actually come up with another plugin which actually runs uh, in their admin. So if you are a Perforce admin or a user who is using, in a, you know, working in a Perforce environment, they are able to run NetApp technologies directly from the Perforce layer. They do, don't have to know what exactly are the NetApp technologies underlying that and what are the commands because these are already part of a plugin which is being co-developed by NetApp and Perforce. And based on that, we will be, I will be showing a demo using that P4 Flex, which actually can use, you can use it anywhere as long as you are using a Perforce environment. Now the top one, the, the right on the top, we are trying to put together a plugin for Jenkins. Now Jenkins is a very common CI tool. 
So we are trying to put together an architecture which can actually connect to any CI tool, not just Jenkins, but because Jenkins has been so extremely popular, we're trying to go with Jenkins. But that architecture can actually fit into any CI Travis or any other CI tool that is available. So if that happens, you do not have to know any underlying technology of NetApp because that is already going to be part of the OpenStack infrastructure. But from the, from the uh, way it has been configured at the right at the top from the Jenkins plugin, you can call those functions directly from the tool itself. So that is going to be available in the second quarter of this year. And I think we are we're hoping really a lot of our customers who are using I, uh, OpenStack in their environments in a developer in, uh, scenario Jenkins plugin would be a really big attraction for connecting that with the NetApp technologies. Now this slide, I would like to highlight where we actually make an impact on the developer's workspace or the or workflow. So first of all is the productivity. The biggest thing that we're trying to, trying to have, and I have got some animated slide later on, a build slide that I'll show you in, in steps, where the user workspace creation. Today, if I've, I've talked a lot of different uh, workspace, uh, sorry, uh, uh, developers and, and organizations and teams, where they say, hey, we got to copy those things. We do a R sync to that. Uh, so obviously it takes a lot of time, because a lot of space, but that is the idea that we have to do it instantaneously, and at the same time reduce the amount of footprints, the storage footprint for a lot of these user workspaces. Because keep in mind, once those Code changes have been checked in in the code repository. You don't need those workspaces anymore because you need to move on to a different kind of a branch, development branch, and you need to start working on. So that is where the focus has to be. How do I instantly create these sandboxes which have been transient, which are temporary in nature, and then once I'm done, I'm going to blow it away. So that's where NetApp technology actually helps in, in doing it. And that is where you can see there, snapshots and flex clone. Now you'd come back and say, hey, we've been hearing snapshots very frequently. Everybody uses it, and what is different with NetApp, all right? Now, the biggest difference with this uh, snapshot is basically this is used for data protection. That's the base underlying. Okay, I create a snapshot, I protect my data. But in our case, we do not do a copy on write. We do a pointer-based to the blocks, the snapshot, they are thin snapshots. That means they do not take additional space. So, in, and that is instantaneous. That means you create a snapshot immediately, and I, have, I will be highlighting that in my demo later on, how soon we can create a snapshot with a, we have taken an Android open source code, which is about 67 gig, and we are creating snapshot almost like less than three seconds. So we are instantaneously creating a snapshot, and that snapshot is primarily a read only. So when you create a clone, you are making that snapshot as a read-write. So then when you give, it, give a workspace based on a clone from your snapshotted volume, which has got a code repository, your developer has that workspace created instantaneously, and that clone does not take any additional space. So that's the importance of NetApp snapshot and cloning compared to anybody else using having their snapshotting capability. We are doing the further data protection, and we are also adding acceleration to the development process without taking additional storage space. And then the second one is the build completion time. And I'll show you in the next slide, when, which is a, a build slide, where I'll be going through a different processes. We are creating an environment, a template for a CI environment, which is a continuous integration environment, where you can actually have this entire build process uh, set up in a way that you do not have to take extra time. It will be mostly doing incremental builds, and it will be a lot more faster compared to any full complete builds that you will be running in a day or in a couple of days, depending upon the schedule that you have. And the third thing is the overall efficiency. Because the snapshots and the cloning mechanism are thin provision, and you do not take additional space, we have got customers reporting back at us saying that from a 60 terabyte, I can reduce that to a three terabyte space during my development time. That is about a 40x improvement as far as storage efficiency is concerned. So that en enables us to say, hey, we have been a storage vendor, but still we are advocating our customers to use the processes in such a way that you can reduce the cost and reduce the storage footprint, yet get the storage efficiency out of that. So if you look at this slide, and this is the first enabler and value that we are providing, and if you see here, we are putting together a continuous integration environment here, and you have got Git and your Jenkins, and you've got a code repository. It is obviously running on OpenStack environment, as I was showing you in the previous slide. So this is your 
code branch, you're having the main code. You've got dev different development branches. So I'll use dev branch one as a sample example uh, in this particular slide when I was moving forward. So if you see here, there is a Git repository, you're taking a snapshot. Now this snapshot is primarily for backup purposes. So any change that happens in the repository, along with the SHA number that you're having, it probably has to have a snapshot to actually take a backup of that. That's the only uh, scenario where you need a snapshot for the core repository. Now, as we move forward, we create a volume. Now, this is something which you're creating a CI environment. You have got a user called Bob, maybe. I'm going using the word um, name Bob because I'll be using it in my demo. And he is the CI owner, and this is the environment that he's creating. So he is creating a volume right there for dev branch one, which is syncing up all the source code and populating that in the dev branch one volume, and then pulling in all the resources over there. So if you see here, you have a C is a compiler, uh, sorry, T is a tools, compilers, libraries, RPMs, all of them have been pulled into this volume, synced up and then you run a build. So once the build passes, then you take a, this becomes your baseline, and you take a snapshot of that volume. So now when the snapshot is created, developer comes in and says, hey, where is my latest snapshot with the changes that I was looking for, the all updated changes, the recent ones, for dev branch one. So immediately he goes and starts clicking a clone. Now keep in mind, this clone is a completely prepackaged. That means you got everything in that clone. You got your source code, your compiled binaries because you ran your build already, and you have got your, uh, all, the, uh, all the dependencies, your tools, your libraries, your compilers, everything is in there. And then you start your CI. Again, depending upon the schedule that you have to run how many number of developer builds versus a CI build in a day, you, your CI build kicks off. And then when CI passes, what we do is create a Docker image and move it over to a different location, which has got a complete prepackaged environment. Why? Suppose six months down the road, a developer says, hey, I, I hit a bug on a, on a SHA number or a change number, which was done a month ago, a few months ago. How do I get back to that environment to replicate the problem? So you just go back and pull up that particular SHA number or the change number and spin up that environment in a con container or a microservice, and you're all good to go to start testing out and replicating the problem, right? So, and again, as I said, this is a complete prepackaging of the software because everything is in there, in that image. And then what happens, this guy, the developer in the workspace makes some changes. The changes are committed, uh, the Jenkins submits the changes into the repository. As soon as that is done, you take a snapshot. Again, as I said, the snapshots are primarily for backup. Right, And then this change is automatically going to be populated in this volume. Once that happens, now this becomes dev branch 1.2. So then you run another build, build passes, you take another snapshot. So when the user says, hey, I want to check on the latest one with the changes coming up from some, some, some other different user, you already got 1.2 available. You take a clone and you start working on the latest workspace. So if you see here, the point that I'm trying to make is the instantaneous creation of workspaces for the developer and with the same time you're constantly updating. And what happens here is when you are running these builds, the, uh, the developer builds, they're all incremental in nature. So what happens? You do not use much of your compute resources. There is not much of a network traffic and you are not hitting the P4, uh, sorry, the Git repository all the time. You are actually updating it. All of these things happening at the dev branch one volume, which is the template that you created for that particular development branch. And when this, then a CI test creates that, that image is created again with the new change number. And then the changes are happening in that location is now committed back and the same process repeats itself, right? So what happens? This, uh, these are all sandboxes. These are all gone. If the users are done, you destroy them. So basically, you've got a workspace with no extra space that has been taken. You're getting the storage efficiency with little reduced cost. And in a cloud scenario, if you think about it, you are being charged. You are, there is always a metering process that is going on. And from a storage perspective, you are getting the storage and at the same time, the efficiency. And then 
you can instantaneously blow, the, blow them away. And this hardly needs any kind of a computer network resources. Everything has been handled by at the storage layer. And then finally what happens is you can promote all the changes to a QA scenario for staging and finally promote it to a build audio deployment in, in a container. So what comes down is, is a complete risk mitigation. How do you mitigate risk? Because you are isolating the code base from the repository to a template to a developer scenario. So we have got a, a complete isolation of the code base and the work that has been, and the changes that have been done by the developer. And then we are actually having a disk storage cost down. You're reducing cost because you are not taking much space in your, in your workspaces that you're creating and instantaneous work creation. So it takes them less than a minute. I'll show you in the video how quickly we can actually <clears throat> create these uh, workspaces uh, instantaneously. Then, as I said, this is all going to be part of the plugin. And as you saw in the previous slide, we already have a Code Easy, which is available for system admins. We also have another called P4 Flex from Perforce, and we are working on a Jenkins plugin right now. So a lot of these plugins are going to work, do all the work for you at the back end. But I'm just trying to show you what the process is in order to enable your development process and accelerate that much more faster. Now, this is another advantage. Now, supposing you have uh, a database. Your database has got about 20,000 objects and you are trying to grow that number to 60,000 objects. You want to drop some schema, make some modification to application logic and a lot of those things in your database, right? So what happens is users come in, you use a plugin, depending upon what is available, you use your Jenkins plugin or P4Flex or CodeEasy, doesn't matter. Then you create a clone of your database. So you don't touch the clone, uh, sorry, your production database, you just clone them and then once you clone it, you mount them. You can mount them directly onto, the, onto your VMs, on the Nova VMs, or you can use containers to mount them. We actually released last week on the 20th, we released a container plugin, NetApp um, Docker, container, Docker volume uh, plugin, which can actually create volumes and you can destroy volumes directly from the container itself. You can actually mount them for the volumes which are already, so supposing if you are having these clones which are nothing but volumes, you can mount it from the Docker container. Or you can use it without that. So what happens is once you do that, you start to modify, test, you do your unit test, and then you start to build the changes that you do in your workspace. And then your workspace is now different because you have added more, more objects to that. So what happens is you then Start, these are the use cases normally that you normally change in the database. You promote, do run the regression. So what happens, you start to promote those changes. When you promote those changes, you start testing it. You test the first uh, fix passes, second one fails. Then we do a rapid restore. We have got something called snap restore, which is again included in this plugins to en enable you to restore rapidly. So instead of going back to your previous states and copying back this lot of these things back again, which takes a lot of time, you do an instantaneous of snap restore. Then you, after the restoring, this, then you start testing. More testing, and then finally this fails again. You restore, and then runs test. So basically, it is a fail fast and fix fast. That's the process. And then what happens is, at the end of the day, the more amount of testing you do, you're saving a lot more of cycles because you are not going to revert, you are taking less time to revert back to the previous state, you're getting a better code quality. And because they're all instantaneous, it is a faster time to market. So these are the bigger enablers actually to using NetApp technology. Because we've been asked all the time, hey, you are a storage vendor, what are you doing in this space and development? Because a lot of these things, we actually do this today in-house. We, in our own code generation, this is what our process is today. Because we also have to see how fast we can develop and how much, how agile mode we can actually adopt to, um, to get our code out in the market for our users. Another use case, supposing you have a scenario like this where you have um, an entire DevOps environment on, on OpenStack, and then if this is your And then if you're using Docker containers over here, and if you look here, if this is your directory structure, one thing keep in mind, you have sort of projects, you've got Android, you've got users and bills, and these are all your cloned objects. I got a customer, um, I think a week ago, I was in a different conference, he says, hey, 
We have got these users who constantly build these uh, workspaces, which obviously doesn't use the Flex clone technology, but if I destroy them, every time the path goes away, I lose the path, and I get an error. How do I do that? And I have seen in some of the presentations where Red Hat promotes namespace and how do you actually have all these things laid out in a file system in a namespace. We actually have a default namespace and junction path where you are able to orchestrate your uh, containers, uh, your, your volumes over here to your containers that is running. I'll show you in a moment how it is doing. So if you're mounting this, if you see here, look at the mount path. You are mounting it all the way up to here. But when you're running this, I don't know what's going on. Okay, if you see here, the path over here, the projects, you can go directly to this location. So if you have to blow away this cloned object, which is transient in nature, you do not have to com compromise on the path because when you're doing an NFS mount, very likely you'll get a NFS tail handle because the path is removed, but you're mounting it and it is not finding that particular location. But in our case, it doesn't happen that way because it's all going to be part of the orchestration layer and how you actually access those cloned objects from a container itself. That's the flexibility we are providing with namespaces. So what I'm trying to highlight here is imagine you have got an NFS share which has got all your tools in that location. You use a container, spin up containers, where you actually point it to that NFS share that can be shared across multiple containers. So you can scale and share the same set of tools. Supposing you are developing applications in the Java, all your Java tools are resided in one location. So that's the advantage that we are providing with reduced manageability, because you don't have to mount each and every volume so that when you destroy that location of the volume, you have to rewrite or remount the path again. You don't have to do all that stuff. So now, I'll spend the next five to 10 minutes for showing the uh, demo. And this demo was actually done from AWS in a hybrid cloud model. We have got the NetApp storage on a private store, on a co-location, and then we are actually running Perforce as an SCM tool from AWS, and then running the entire workflow of a code development of Android open source code. In, in this manner. So we'll just go through this. How do I do this full screen? So I don't know why my screen is cut off over here, but I'm trying to log in over here um, from Amazon, trying to spin up an instance with uh, Perforce running, a Perforce instance. We're starting up a Perforce instance over here from AWS. And from the, the party session, we're logging in. We're trying to see here if you see here, two things, you're mounting the NFS share right here from the storage itself. Is okay, thank you. So, so when you do a mount point over here, you see the mount right there in the pre repo is located, you start that, and you're running the scripts, and if you see, the scripts are already running. So now, you're logging in as Bob, Bob is your CI user, 
and then he's creating um, a, a environment just like the template that I showed you in the previous slide. He's logging in and doing a pre flex volumes to list all the volumes. And if you see here, these are the volumes that are pre pre present today when he starts to check in or check in the size, number of volumes that you have there. Then what, what I'm trying to hear is we are doing a build environment for a slow traditional checkout, which you normally do a P4 sync and then do a make. And then we're also using a P4 flex development flow using Jenkins as a, as a template that I showed you earlier. So this is uh, the directory structure. If you see here, you've got the different code, uh, Jenkins build, the nightly build, and the release builds. Then you have got Bob under the user with slow developer and test fast developer. And then you have got the various different workspaces. So on the left-hand side, you have the slow developer where you actually having on the left-hand side, and that's the Bob Jenkins, the CI owner, and then you have got the fast developer terminal window, and we'll go through this process. So if you see here on the left-hand side, we are starting off creating a workspace using P4 client, and then we are doing a P4 sync, and then it starts to compile the code. So this is the process which is a normal behavior in a scenario like this. So when you start that, you put a path to your depot over there, and configuration file, you're doing a P4 client to identify to the proposed database that you are, this is the workspace that you're creating, and you're providing the path in the config file. And then once that is done, you start the P4 sync process. And then you head out and grab a cup of coffee while this is happening. Right, you're syncing up code. Now on the right-hand side, while this is happening, let's see what Bob the Builder or the CI owner is doing right now. So this is the flow that we follow. If you see here, we are creating, if you remember the slide that I showed you, we're creating a volume for a dev branch, and then we're actually running a P4 sync. We are syncing up that volume, and then we are running some uh, the build commands, the scripts for running the builds. Build passes, okay, we create a snapshot. And once the snapshot is created, then we start working with the, uh, uh, this is the build flow, and then we start to have this guy, the P4 flex snapshot is created right over here. Once the snapshot is created, that means whenever the user comes in and says, hey, whichever snapshot is available for me to pick up for my workspace, and the next one is a perforce workspace developer flow, which the developer comes in and says, checks in what the snapshot is, and then this is where it does a change ownership. Now, change ownership today, we have a script to actually change ownership of that user, but moving forward, it actually is going to be a native feature in our ONTAP, our, 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 our NetApp code, because when a user logs in, it'll be logging in as a username and UID and GID. So that UID and GID will be used during creating the clone. So if you look here, let's see what Bob is working on. So he just checks into the volume and then looks into the directory of Jenkins build and give, makes a list of that. All the volumes, all the files are located there. And then when he does a P4 change and checking what changes has happened, he says finds the change number 29 is already there, but the snapshot does not include, sorry, the uh, volume snapshot does not include there, if you see here. So here it is creating a snapshot for change number 29. And if you look at the creation time, is only three seconds. So that is what I was talking about, how fast we can create snapshots with NetApp technology. And then once we list all the snapshots, now you see build number 29 listed over there. So once this, this is the, the slow builder is still making the compile at uh, the sync. So that right now, the fast developer comes in and checks what is the snapshot available. This is 29. So he does list all the snapshots over here, finds the latest snapshot as 29, and then scratches a clone. And you look at the time that we take for the clone. So the clone completes in 20 seconds. Now once the clone is completed, let's get into the workspace and see how owned by Bob and DevOps. It has to be owned by the fast developer. The, the own ownership has to change. So we are running a script right now to change ownership. This is taking time based on the size of the code, but that is changing in the new re next release of 
of Net NetApp operating system that we're releasing um, in the summer uh, this year. So it will be, you see here, it is done in less than two minutes. You've got everything in his workspace right now. So now you see the productivity has now improved immensely, and that is how we actually do it internally at NetApp too for our developers. So now you go and make some changes to the path and make that as a P4 client, so to register with the Perforce database that this is a user workspace. And then if you do a, now you're doing a P4 a flush, that means you're only syncing up the changes that has happened on change number 29. Now, a few things keep in mind. We are not running a compile. We are not using any compute resources. There is no network traffic, nothing. Everything happens on the workspace itself. Only syncing up the changes that has happened since our last change happened. It's number between 28 and 29. So once that is done, we can start doing editing a file. So let's go and start to edit a file and make some changes and then commit those changes into the Perforce depot. So if you see here, all the compiled system files are there. So what happens here, if you make only one change in your file, one line or five lines, you're only running to compile those lines of changes that you have done. And that is how we are reducing the build time also. That's the reason when I was showing you the slide before, I was mentioning this is how your flow works. So if you, if you look over here, the final edit, so we are editing a file. So we are doing a P4 edit, making a change and adding a line into this uh, text file. And as soon as we save it, you'll see the change number is now 30. You see here, change number is 30. So once you have that, you then start to do a P4 change dash M1, and then start to sync up what changes has been done. So if you see the clone that we created, this is the amount of space. So 67 gig of total source code is only taking about 18 megabyte. That is a huge space savings right there. Think about when you compare this with your regular sync and copy operation, this is very minimal. And it actually took around four minutes to complete the entire workspace with almost, almost very nothing, no storage space taken. So now for the slow developer, it's still doing the sync operation, so it completed after an hour later, and then it is not done yet. We have to compile it. So the compilation takes about another process for the slow developer. And then while we do that, we initiate that, the make command. So while this is taking a longer time for the slow developer on the left, so it took about 108 minutes total. By the time the fast developer got the snapshot, made changes, submitted the changes, and he's done. So it is instantaneous. We take very minimum space. I would say almost nothing from a 60, 67 gig to an 18 megabyte. It's nothing from a storage footprint. And we are done because you're only running the compile for the lines of change that you're doing. And those are all incremental developer builds that you're running. And then the CI owner can run a complete incremental build, a full build at the end of the day, depending on the schedule, which does not impact any of the developers. So this is the template that a CI environment can have in order to provide that to the developer to ex expedite or accelerate the development process. Now going back to my, this is all the demo. Now going back to the slide, I got one more. Just to summarize, Just to summarize, instantaneous workspaces, the creation and deletion. Now again, you have to delete those workspaces also. They are absolutely instantaneous. They are, they are just sandboxes, just blow them away once the developer work is done. And then is reduced checkout time. You don't take much time, you don't take much space. 
improved code quality because you continuously keep on testing it because you're running the test based on a template that you create in your CI environment and reducing infrastructure cost. So if you look at the overall impact from a storage to the infrastructure above that, the amount of uh, network traffic is very little, the amount of compute resources you're taking is very little, and we are actually taking it to the next level where we are going to run Docker containers on top of those uh, compute resources that we are having, the VMs, Nova VMs that we are having. So probably by the next time, the next OpenStack Summit event happens later this year, we'll be having much more advanced configuration with Docker containers running on top of that. But bottom line that I'm trying to make here is we are, as a storage vendor, the native technologies that we have and the plugins that we are working uh, in partnerships with a lot of different um, development workflow vendors out there like the Jenkins, Cloud B Jenkins, uh, SCM, SCM tools available. That has enabled us to give us a complete, um, uh, what you call, focus on the technologies directly which can impact the overall workflows uh, in the development process. That's all I had, any questions? Yes. That's a great question, and I'll take you to this slide that I had earlier, this one. So if you see here, the bottom part is all system administrator, yes. If you use the bottom plugin, it'll be very system driven, where you have to have the system administrator doing that. But if you go to the middle one, that is where you're, if you're using Perforce, your Perforce admin or the user can actually generate all that from a Perforce command. But the top one that we're releasing, that answers all your question because it is completely seamless of what NetApp technology is underneath the covers. It will be a user interface which will be tied into a Jenkins um, template. And from there, you'll be making all the choices, which are the snapshots I'm having. I want to create a workspace. It creates everything under the covers. You, don't, uh, you are not exposed to that at all. So that is happening in the second quarter of this year. We're almost done with that. We're starting to test it. So once we do it, we will be having that for the OpenStack in infrastructure for, with a pass integration, as well as uh, for a hybrid environment and AWS and any pub, uh, public hypervisor. And we completely understand that because we do not want to expose a lot of our technologies to developers because they don't care. And we totally understand that, and that's the reason where the Jenkins plugin will be a lot more helpful because CI is something which is very synonymous to a lot of the developing community. Um, so that is something which we try to integrate that directly. All right, if I don't have any more questions, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>